Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Uh, ben is back from the Munich Security Conference. He bought, <laughs> he brought a piece of the blob with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just sitting there, kind of moving and shaking. You know, I, I re-upped my credentials. You know, how'd um, it go? Uh, it, you know, it's 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 an incredibly condensed environment, and it's crazy to like walk into the, like the this kind of old hotel in Munich and recognize like 90 people in the lobby immediately, and like it's nice to not be in government. I actually don't miss it at all. But you see, you'll remember this, Tommy, like. 20 people you know just like steamrolling by trailing like Kamala Harris. Uh-huh. Like, oh, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Derek Cholet. There's like right, you right. Know, Dan Crittenbrink. There, you know, and everyone's um, harried and everyone's on their phone. Everybody's harried. Everybody's like looking over everybody's shoulder to see if there's someone more important that they should be talking to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, there's like people gawking at... It, it's funny because it's like inverse celebrity culture. Uh-huh. You know, it's like... Um, um, like it was the Latvian yeah, foreign yeah. minister. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Instead of like Dua Lipa, it's like, uh, <laughs> oh my God, that's the ex-president of, of Estonia. You know, like, uh, uh, so it was good. Um, uh, um, yeah, I saw our buddy David Limey. Uh, nice. Yeah, he was uh, like the mayor of Munich, you know. I want to ask you about this later, but, you know, I saw he put out a video today talking about recognizing a Palestinian state. Yes. Pushing for a two-state solution. Yes. So I was very excited to Labor's see that. Labor is definitely getting... You know, after having been pretty close to where the Tories were at the beginning, you know, they're definitely differentiating themselves, which is good. Yeah, and Labor just crushed in two by elections, which are like special elections for congressional seats. Yeah. Equivalent. Yeah. So good. Hopefully, pretty soon we'll have a Labor government. Uh, okay, well, we got a packed show today, Ben. Uh, we are coming up on the two year anniversary of the full scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're going to spend a lot of time on that subject today. Also, it's been nearly a decade since Russia invaded eastern Ukraine in 2014. So, nearly a decade of war for people uh, all across Ukraine. Uh, we're going to dig into the latest from the battlefield. We're going to hear stories from Ukrainians inside and outside the country about what life is like. Uh, and then we'll talk about what might come next. Uh, and then later in the show, you're going to hear my interview with Mstislav Chernov, a filmmaker and the director of an incredible documentary, 20 Days in Mariupol. Have you seen this film, Ben? I haven't. I've read about it, but I need to see it. Yeah. Whew. yeah. Like emotionally prepare yourself. Yeah. Don't do what I did, which was watch it a couple hours before going out to Valentine's Day dinner with Hannah. <laughs> and then just being like emotionally yeah. vacant. Yeah. This is not about me, but it's yeah. a very powerful yeah. film. Incredibly powerful. He was like the only journalist. A couple of these folks were the only journalists in Mariupol in those first days of the war. And you'll watch it and you're like, oh my God, all of the coverage that I watched in those early couple of weeks was from this one guy shooting in like while getting bombarded and then like desperately finding a place to upload his footage. Yeah. And I, I think, it, you know, in uh, the one thing I'd say about this is that in this age of like social media and short attention span, the documentaries are like more and more valuable. So powerful. You know, just yeah. to be able to sit with something for a couple of hours. Yes. So uh, I'm definitely going to look forward to seeing that. Yeah, Alone and I were talking about this. Like you can read a thousand print stories. You can yeah. do the New Yorker deep dive, but you watch... 20 days in Mariupol, and you are like affected for days yeah. uh, um, in, in the powerful way. Tough New Yorker hit. Yeah. Well, listen, yeah. <laughs> love a good New Yorker story. You know, no offense to all our friends over there. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to cover the latest news about the murder of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. We'll explain why Tucker Carlson loves the Moscow Metro. Uh, do a quick update on <laughs> Russian spakes nukes, which uh, Ben thinks I like a little too much, I think. Yep. Then we cover the war in Gaza, Indonesia's recent election, what Jared Kushner is whining about, and mankinis. So, uh, ranging show. I, may, I didn't see mankinis on the list. Well, uh, you're going to so be not prepared for it. wearing yeah. one. Uh, okay. <laughs> Another awkward pivot to our first topic, which is two years of war in Ukraine. So, uh, let's start with some grim statistics. So, Russia has taken 11% of Ukrainian territory since February 24th, 2022. Obviously, at one point, they had taken more than that. Ukraine battled back and, and retook some territory, but they still have lost uh, over a tenth of their country. 130,000 Ukrainian troops are dead, severely wounded, or missing. More than 10,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed. Nearly a quarter of the Ukrainian population has now been displaced by the war. Uh, On the Russian side, 200,000 Russian troops are dead, severely wounded, or missing. And 800,000 Russians have fled the country uh, for a variety of reasons, political, economic, etc. So this is just existential for both countries. Astonishing number, yeah. Astonishing numbers. Um, In recent months, the momentum in the war has shifted pretty decidedly against Ukraine. Uh, After months of brutal fighting, Ukrainian forces fully withdrew from the city of of Divka, uh, the Donetsk region. The New York Times said that British and Ukrainian intelligence estimate that in 2024 alone, Russian forces dropped about 1 million pounds of aerial bombs on this 12 square mile area around Avdivka, uh, while the Ukrainian troops were forced to ration ammunition 
like artillery shells, and they also basically ran out of air defense systems and interceptors, which is why these Russian planes were able to just fly over them and basically carpet bomb the area. Uh, Russian and Ukrainian troops have been fighting for control of Divka since 2014, but this is really the, the biggest battlefield victory for the Russian side since Bakhmut. Um, uh, Avdivka is one of about five places in eastern Ukraine where Ukrainian forces are trying desperately to hold defensive lines, uh, and new Russian forces are just showing no sign of letting up despite taking massive casualties. This, you, your artillery shortage, I know, Ben, uh, we'll talk about this in a second, was a big topic of discussions at the Munich Security Forum. Uh, last year, the EU pledged 1 million shells to Ukraine by March of 2024. They say their uh, the efforts to ramp up production are on track, but it looks like they're only going to deliver half of those shells by that March deadline they had set for this year, so falling well short. Uh, as we've discussed, uh, Congress here pissed away months in the Senate working on an immigration bill that the Republicans walked away from until the Senate passed a supplemental funding bill that includes $60 billion for funding for Ukraine, but the House of Representatives is dithering on what to do about it next because Speaker Johnson is a coward and he is worried he might lose his speakership. Uh, here's a clip of President Biden talking about the delays in the House last week at a press event. Is there anything you can do to get ammunition to the Ukrainians without a supplemental from Congress? No, but it's about time they step up, don't you think? Instead of going on a two-week vacation? Two weeks! They're walking away. Two weeks! What are they thinking? My God! This is bizarre. And it's just reinforcing all the concern and 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 almost I won't say panic, but real concern about the United States being a reliable ally. This is outrageous. Uh, and here's a clip of President Zelensky uh, asking for more support at the Munich Security Forum. We all must do not do not something, but everything possible to defeat the aggressor. Please, everyone remember that dictators do not go on vacation. Hate raid knows no pause. Enemy artillery does not fall silent due to procedural issues. Warriors standing against the aggressor need sufficient strength. Second, we should not fear Putin's defeat. Putin is a threat to all free nations. So Ben, uh, you, hasn't really gotten its shit together fast enough to help Ukraine, at least enough. The U.S. is being held hostage by Trump and the MAGA Republicans. That was plan A, was to get those bills through Congress. You just got back from Munich. Is there a plan B being discussed, or is everyone just kind of waiting on us? I mean, I think panic is uh, an appropriate word <laughs> to describe, really? actually, yeah. the vibe that I picked up in Munich. You know, I think that most every conversation you have, and I met with a lot of different Europeans, uh, the panic is about two things. It's about the supplemental and it's about the U.S. election. Mm -hmm. And right. that's kind of coloring the backdrop. Bad and worse, to, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of coloring the backdrop to all this stuff. Um, and and look, I, I actually think that um, Biden's tone, Zelensky's tone, what, what, I, what I think is right about it is for a while, I think the strategy was to be really grateful. The Ukrainians, you know, thank you so much for all the support mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of courting the Republicans and, and actually, I think it's better to just kind of go right at this and um, and call it out as they're doing, because um, we're not getting anywhere. You know, we're not catching flies with honey here. No. And um, I think there has to be an effort to just really just pound away at the irresponsibility of this. There are enough Republicans, by the way, who agree with that, that maybe there's some procedural way in which you can get a vote um, that, you know, sidelines the MAGA people. Um, if not, oh, if it was yeah. an up or down vote, I bet you'd get 300 plus votes in the House. I mean, yes. maybe more. You would. And so that that's the only thing you're going to be able to take a shot at. You know, I don't know that you can uh, Mike Johnson, whatever his name is. You know, like, I don't know that you can count on that guy, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat necessarily. No. Uh, so you just went to Mar-a-Lago on Monday. Yeah. I, I th the plan B, you know, I think there are some things that can be done and there have been already some reports around. You know, the, the U.S. could essentially replenish European stocks and then the Europeans give their weapons to the Ukrainians. So there's a kind of bank shot way in which you can um, move uh, stockpiles, of, which, which, by the way, just highlights the inanity of the Republican opposition. Like there's a supply chain of, of, of arms around the world that, you know, emanate from U.S. defense contractors. And instead of just the more efficient way of, 
like spending the money here in the United States to manufacture arms that then go to the Ukrainians, maybe there'll have to be some bank shot where we're escalating uh, our sales to Europeans who then are providing the arms to the Ukrainians. So it, it's just so stupid, all because of some kind of MAGA politics. It, it, it points to how dumb it is. But I do think you have to be looking at that plan B. I think that the Europeans, you know, they, there's a lot of talk in Munich about their need to be uh, kind of recapitalizing their own capacity to, to provide arms to the Ukrainians. Um, they're not going to be able to do that in any kind of immediate term time frame. But I think they're thinking about what happens if Trump wins, and we right. may need to have the capacity to provide artillery and things like this, shells. Um, and, and just because that's a year out or two years out even, look, I'd rather there not be war. I'm like I'm not suggesting that that's the best case scenario. But as a hedge, I think they do need to be doing that because you know sometimes a year or two can seem like a really long time. But look, we're two years into this war. Yeah. It's a stalemate. There's no reason not to be thinking about 2026 or 2027. Again, not because anybody wants there to be a war then, but just because you, you need to, to have uh, a certain capacity um, to deal with contingencies. Russia, despite sanctions, has managed to dramatically increase uh, its own domestic production of those kinds of armaments. They've managed to find alternative supplies from the North Koreans. Uh, particularly on artillery from the Iranians on other capabilities. So, you know, whether it's unsticking some stuff from U.S. politics or whether it's the Europeans ramping their capacity up, again, that's not necessarily going to close the gap right away, but it's all necessary, especially because if a supplemental does get through too, it's unlikely to be one at the scale that the administration asked for. You know, maybe they can get some skinny down version of it done. Um, but yeah, like it's it's... In a war of attrition in which Russia is a bigger country with a bigger, you know, a pool of people to draw from in its own conscription efforts um, and a huge military industrial complex that's churning this stuff out, time is going to work to their advantage. And again, even if you want an end to the war and even if you're open to a negotiated settlement um, short of Ukraine taking back all its territory, which I think, as we've said, is like challenging most likely going to be the case they're going to have to do, you want them to be in a stronger position in that right. negotiation you don't want them in the negotiation having run out of weapons because then putin's know? not going to yeah exactly yeah i mean the, to your point i mean it takes so long to ramp up these supply chains and get the infrastructure going like think about how long it takes to to build a factory to make more patriot missile batteries right like that's not a fast process that's why the estonians put forward a plan to win the war by saying all the nato allies should spend uh 0.25% of GDP for the next four years and commit that to Ukraine. And they think that would be more than enough to de defeat the Russians. Um, I did see some good news in sort of like little bits like NBC News reported the Biden administration is close to giving Ukraine longer range attack of missiles that could hit Crimea. So it seems like some of the guardrails are coming off. I don't know that that's good news, but I think it's what, what I think, you know, Ukraine supporters would like to see. Uh, also, I saw that uh, Japan announced they're going to provide $12.1 in aid to Ukraine. So you're seeing other allies stepping up. I was thinking about how the 2024 NATO summit is in July, uh, in D.C. in July. Um, Trump's attacks on NATO, the general state of the war, is really going to up the pressure on that summit to deliver in a big way for the Ukrainians uh, or to at least get all the NATO allies to commit to the 2% level of defense spending that they're supposed to hit. Yeah, I think what is was also kind of evident at Munich is... Uh, First of all, there was some premature triumphalism at the you know early stages of this war. Yeah. So last year at Munich, it was a lot of like mutual congratulation, as if like Russia had been defeated and we'd saved you know democracy, um, and that wasn't the case. Now I think there's some premature defeatism. <laughs> you know, like the 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 reality is somewhere in between. But to your point, if there's nothing kind of particularly consequential beyond the same rhetoric about NATO standing together. In July, I think that that would be problematic. So, between now and July, I think you need to be building some sense of what the plan is and what the vision is and how Ukraine can be supported in the long run. As we've talked about, I think it's all the more reason to be um, accelerating things like Ukraine drawing closer to EU membership. You know, kind of a, a vision for where this is going, what kind of security assurances Ukraine might have, because. If this seems to be moving in a direction of some kind of frozen type conflict in which Ukraine doesn't control a big chunk of its territory, 
you at least want to be showing that we're going to be able to help Ukraine defend itself with the territory it has, um, rebuild, uh, be kind of woven into the infrastructure of Europe, um, so that it's not just a sense that they're dangling out there to be incrementally cannibalized by by Russia. Yeah. One little bit of good news on the politics here in the U.S. There's a Pew poll that came out that questioned that some foreign policy polling. 74% of Americans view the war in Ukraine as important to U.S. national interests. 43 to, 43% describe it as very important. And 59% of Americans describe the war in Ukraine as important to them personally when asked. So again, if Congress was responding to the wishes and will of the American people, we would actually be passing the supplemental. We would have done it five months ago. Um, but again, we wanted to you know, hear from people, uh, Ukrainians either living in Ukraine or forced to live abroad because of the war. Um, many of them who are still in Ukraine have been forced to adapt to life living in a war zone under constant threat of shelling. We spoke with Maria Avdieva, a security analyst based in Kyiv, about what it is like. Here's a clip. I have just had a conversation this morning with a friend of mine, and she said that I would never imagine that we will be in this war for two years. And this is, I think, what a lot of people in Ukraine, including myself, feel. People can't live in the basements or they can't hide all the time. They need to continue uh, doing their everyday jobs because if everyone will move out or will start uh, sitting in the basement, then nothing nothing will work. And uh, this is actually this remarkable uh, resilience of Ukrainians uh, which you can see in many places, uh, like those uh, teachers who continue to teach in uh, underground in the metro school or from their homes, hiding somewhere in the bathroom when there is an air siren, continuing their online lessons, or uh, the restaurants uh, that uh, reopen after they were destroyed for two times. There is a restaurant in Kharkiv uh, in the city center that reopened after the first attack and then another strike, they, it was destroyed again. And I saw that the owners are again cleaning everything up and they will try to re reopen for the third time. So this is uh, very something very remarkable about Ukrainians. And when I ask people how do they do it and why, it's because uh, they say that then who else will do that? If we all abandon uh, what is important uh, for us, who who else will do that? And she also mentioned that uh, the kids in Ukraine are either doing fully remote learning for school or they're going to school in literal bunkers. Those are basically your two options. Yeah, and I think what comes across in that clip is that there's this new normal of living through the war um, and that it's open-ended, you know, and the kind of uncertainty this could go for a year, three years, five years, you know, there's this kind of sense of an open-ended uh, nature to this. Now, in some way, that was always going to be the case because, as we've said, like, Russia's not going anywhere, you yeah. know, um, yeah. and and for the time being, Putin's not, you know. So, you know, even if, you know, this is what was wrong with some of the, that triumphalism of a year ago, like victories at hand and, you know, uh, we're one more, you know, op-ed about F-16s away from, right? Yeah, you, you know, it, it's it's just one more weapons system. It, but but I think what comes across, you know, there's been so much focus on Zelensky. Um, understandably, I mean, he did a lot right and he showed a lot of personal courage. But in a way, it almost obscures that, like the the enormous courage of just everyday people in Ukraine. You know, it's not just Zelensky mm -hmm. giving speeches and stuff. Th this is people adjusting to unimaginable circumstances. Um, and, 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 and there's a resilience to that. Because what this war is ultimately going to become about, I think, is who does time work for? You know, Does time work for a Putin who's just grinding and grinding and grinding down the will of the Ukrainians and the attention of uh, Europe and the United States and able to there incrementally cannibalize more and more of Ukraine? Or does Ukraine become more resilient, more interwoven into the security architecture of the United States and Europe, more capable of defending itself? And Putin is the one who's starting to suffer from, you know, people, uh, the huge loss of life on his end, um, the communities that are, are hollowed out, um, the longer term impact of, uh, you know, having this kind of bizarre war economy. Um, 
that's the question is, is who's going to be stronger three to five years from now in, in even a frozen conflict scenario? Is it Ukraine or is it Russia? Yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, we can help it be the Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, we also, as we mentioned at the top, there's also millions of Ukrainians who have been forced to live outside the country. Uh, here's a clip from our conversation with Daria Kristenko, a Ukrainian refugee in Poland working for an aid organization. I remember when we first came, I we had a feeling that it will be for several months. I came with my mom and my son, and my mom was sure that by May she will be home. It's already second year, and we don't see that it's coming. It's I cannot talk to my son and promise him that we will come back soon because it is not safe. We are from Kiev, and every day there are attacks, and the bill, the people are killed. So, and you know, being in in a place where we are at risk of you know, dying every day, it's very stressful. And this is what I explained to my son, that we are in a safe place. We need to adjust to the situation and we need to just accept what it is and to find the best out of it, to find the best solution. And to, we don't know. It's very difficult to have long-term plans, to be honest, because I had my whole life planned and now and then in one day it, it all disappeared. I had a job, I had the flat, and now it's, I, I live in a complete strange country. And now I, I know that maybe I shouldn't be planning for long term. I should be just talking and the same with my son, to be honest, and to say that this is what our life is now. Let's just make it the best life for the current situation. It's not easy to to communicate with children, but it's very important, I think, to be honest and to say what it is. And of course, to be hopeful to return home one day, but also to be realistic that probably this is not going to be soon. Just uh, another example of, you know, courage and fortitude there after two brutal years. Yeah, I mean, and like a couple of quick things on this. Uh, one is, you know, comes across in her voice. Sometimes people look at this and think, well, they're safe. They're in these other European countries. But oftentimes these are people that you can't do the same job that, you know, maybe you yeah. were a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher or what, whatever you were in Ukraine. You, you can't just kind of go pick that up in some other country. And your right? welcome can get worn out. Yeah, your whole. You well, th and that's the second part is like th there in this. I heard from some U Europeans. There's a kind of, you know, whiff in the American discourse of like, why are we giving so much more assistance? That never counts. You know, a German told me, for instance, that they spend something like seven billion dollars a year hosting just the Ukrainian refugees, and that that number is sometimes not counted. Right, there, yeah. There's a fatigue, but also like this costs money too to support those refugees, and you obviously want to see that continue. But the third and most important thing I wanted to say is that the longer this goes on, it is a huge danger to Ukraine's future about whether or not those people return. Right. Because if they lose you know millions of people um, to just permanent emigration. Uh, that's going to make it much harder for them to rebuild. Um, it's, you know, you and I talked about that Masha Gessen piece, I think, last week. There's some resentment growing up. The people that are right. in Ukraine kind of resent the people who aren't there, right. and that creates societal tensions. You hope that the conditions emerge where even if the war is not, quote unquote, over, that, that people feel confident going back to at least parts of Ukraine. Um, so, yeah, it's not know, guaranteed, yeah. though. I mean, especially imagine if you're a five year old kid and you spend two, three, four years growing up in some part of Poland, like you're not going to want to go home to a country you barely remember at that point. I mean, impossibly difficult challenges for these families and these parents in particular. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's turn to Russia, Ben, because last Friday we recorded a bonus episode uh, on the death of Russian opposition leader and anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny. If you want to dig deeper into his life and legacy and, and murder, uh, I recommend you check out that episode. We're going to focus on events since Friday. So uh, Navalny's mother says that Russian authorities have told her they won't hand over her son's remains for at least 14 days. Uh, and on Tuesday, she released a video message appealing to Putin directly to release his body. Uh, hundreds of Russians have been arrested for laying flowers at memorials or otherwise trying to pay tribute to Navalny. There's an awful video, Ben, I don't know if you saw this, this of the police taking one mourner and like shoving his face into a snowbank and just like humiliating this guy for no reason. Um, but perhaps most significant since Friday is the fact that Yulia Navalnaya, uh, Navalny's widow, announced in a YouTube video that she is going to continue his work. It was all in Russian, so I'm just going to read a couple quotes. Uh, one of them is, I'm going to continue the work of Alexei Navalny and continue to fight for our country. I call on you to stand beside me, to share not only in the grief and endless pain that has enveloped us, 
and won't let go. I ask you to share my rage, to share my rage, anger, and hatred of those who dared to kill our future. Uh, she also said, we know exactly why Putin killed Alexei three days ago. We will tell you about it soon. We will tell you their names and show you their faces. By killing Alexei, Putin killed half of me, half of my heart, and half of my soul. But I still have the other half, and it tells me that I have no right to give up. Um, so, Ben, I mean, I think that starts to answer one question we got a lot in the Discord questions from last week, which is whether anyone can fill the void left by Alexei Navalny. Uh, Yuli also met with a bunch of EU leaders while in Munich, so she's you know serious about planning uh, steps to get accountability for his murder. Um, so, Ben, I, a lot of Putin's critics are hoping to use this moment to galvanize support for Ukraine, to get Western countries to, for example, use the $300 billion frozen assets for Ukrainian reconstruction. We saw right before we started recording, the, the Biden White House said they're going to avail a big sanctions package. Is there anything you see like that I don't know, the people should be motivating around to seize this moment and kind of like force action on something? Well, first of all, um, on the body piece of this and the what Yulia said about, um, you know, releasing information, look, nobody should be surprised that they're hiding whatever happened to his body. And uh, of course they are. The reason that does matter, though, is I, I, you can kind of open all these court cases, you know, the European Court of Justice or you know, international justice. It, that's all worth doing, by mm -hmm. the way, because, you know, you want to show that there will be kind of open ended efforts to hold people accountable from Putin on down to whoever the people were at the prison. Um, I, I think that's a worth worthwhile thing to do. Um, I think she can fill a lot of space in terms of, of being a moral authority um, and in, in terms of being a kind of rallying point for the existing infrastructure, particularly in people that are in exile. You know, and Navalny, as we've talked about, has this kind of essentially a media enterprise outside of the country. It'd be good to see that continue and get support. And, so, you know, she uniquely probably can get meetings with the heads of, you know, the EU and right. European yeah. government. So that that's useful, um, even if she's not going <clears> to <throat> fill the same political space that Navalny did. Um, she's not a politician like he, he was. But she can kind of keep um, that kind of connectivity in a way that nobody else can. Um, but in terms of like the the consequences, I, like you know, the I I I really and you and I were kind of dark joking about this on the way in. Like, and it's not that it's funny, but it's just that there's a repetition of like sanctions as somehow being the tool that's the you know the punishment. Um, I just it doesn't matter. Like, I, there's not some sanction that's really gonna really hit home here. I do think that the transfer of assets, though, like that's a real thing. I don't get what's and, holding that up. I mean, it, it there's a lot of you know, it's setting a new precedent. It's, sure, you know, it's a norm breaking thing. So is invading and, Ukraine. So is assassinating <laughs> you know people all over the right. world as Putin has done. So I I do think that like getting that money out the door, getting it to the Ukrainians, um, shaming the Republicans who are sending the way of assistance. Um, again, like I I was saying on our special episode, like doing some of the work that Navalny did in his organization, exposing the corruption of Putin, you know, uh, maybe the sanctions package, okay, in addition to sanctions, like just more effort to go after, you know, all the money that's hid in all these places, the kind of enforcement side of it um, is important too. But we should not, you know, overstate any of this. I mean, this is part of the message of Navalny being dead is that, you know, this is, it's the same thing as with the war in Ukraine. Barring some rapid collapse of uh, of the kleptocratic house of cards in Russia, which would be great if it happened, um, this is a long term struggle here, and I do believe that Navalny's example will be powerful one year, three years, five years, ten years from now. Um, and, and it's worth keeping infrastructure in place so that when there is an opening in Russia for some change, there there are voices out there, there's organization out there, um, there's international legal procedures to hold people accountable that are out there. Um, but you know, this isn't going to be a light switch with some sanctions and a new leader that just leads to change. No. See, uh, Trump's comment on Navalny three days later, yeah. <laughs> basically said it reminded him that America is bad and he seemed to maybe compare himself to Alexei Navalny because he's being prosecuted for breaking laws. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, Good stuff. no bottom whatsoever. Yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah. no bottom. Uh, a couple things, uh, you should also know, uh, Twitter briefly suspended Yulia Navalny's account. Uh, they were also blocking our ability to search for her account. So God knows what is happening at that company at this point. 
Um, the New York Times did a piece on some. Well, of the, you know, the, Putin flattered Elon a bit in his Tucker right, interview. Right, that's true. You know, so maybe now all of a sudden, called him a genius. The uh, all in, you know, the PayPal brigades are uh, <laughs> the David Sachs turn their eyes on Yulia Navalny. Secretary crazy, of Suck. Yeah. Uh, the New York Times did a piece, Ben, on Navalny's, uh, some of his most recent letters that I thought was very worth reading. That was a great piece. You want to yeah. hear about him. Yeah. And again, a sense of humor just comes through all of them. Yeah. Uh, the Washington Post had a report on how Russian uh, disinformation has been used against uh, Zelensky and against Navalny that I thought was interesting. And then, uh, worrisomely, on Tuesday, the FSB announced that they had arrested a 33-year-old woman who's a dual national and lives here in Los Angeles. So apparently she was visiting her parents in Russia. Her little sister lives there as well, her 90-year-old grandparents. The charge is some bullshit uh, that she had supported the Ukrainian efforts. I heard it was like a $50 donation maybe to some charity in New York. But uh, it, it's worrisome that Putin seemingly is taking more American hostages. And I think last week, Tony Blinken spoke with Paul Whelan who's been detained in a Russian prison for like five years now. Yeah, and I, I saw this other report about, you know, a potential assassination in Spain um, of, of some... Oh, uh, uh, a Russian pilot who had flown yeah. his like helicopter out of the country. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess the point between the detention you talk about in St. Petersburg and the assassination in Spain and Navalny, you know, this really is what's what's so intense about it is there's just no boundary that like like you know, beyond not dropping nuclear bombs you know like putin there's just not a lot of restraints you know like mm -hmm. even in the cold war and i you know i'm sure historians could at me on this it, it felt like there was these kind of unwritten rules about like you know assassination in third countries i'm sure that did take place but Putin keeps pushing the envelope, and I guess the point I'd make in response is just echoing what we were saying earlier, but things like seizing assets from oligarchs and giving it to Ukraine, do, uh, I think in response to Putin busting all these norms, there has to be a greater willingness to do unusual things in response, yeah. and, and not obviously killing people, um, but yeah, like, and not just sanctions, but I mean, literally getting creative, again, blowing the whistle on... Uh, and exposing uh, the the kind of the kleptocracy flowing um, through the international financial system, like just seizing assets and you know giving them to the Ukrainians. Like th there has to be kind of an asymmetric response to the asymmetric stuff that Putin's doing. Yeah, and, and I don't. He's whacking people in London. <laughs> yeah, and that's and look. I'm not. You know, this is not just about being on some ladder of permanent escalation. I think there needs to be diplomacy. I, I think there needs to be an openness to negotiation around uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, there have to be, you know, what we in bad foreign policy parlance would call off ramps. But there, you also just kind of can't, this guy's, you know, uh, this guy's doing un unusual stuff. Um, and there has to be a sense that th there's a a creative ways to respond to that that are not just violence, that are more about um, uh, other, other things that expose the nature of, of the regime and what he's doing. Yeah. One more thing on the Russia point, and this is this is far from the most important thing we'll talk about today, but we did want to quickly underscore how poorly timed and humiliating Tucker Carlson's visit to Moscow was to interview Vladimir Putin. Uh, so remember, Tucker did not ask Putin about Alexei Navalny, of course, because he was too busy trying and failing to get Putin to blame the U.S. for the invasion of Ukraine. But Tucker did have time to go film some propaganda videos. Uh, here's a clip from one of them. We're standing in front of the Kievskaya metro station and this train station next to it. Now the metro station was built by Joseph Stalin 70 years ago. And the question is, how's it doing now? After 70 years. So we went into it to take a look and what we found shocked us. It's perfectly clean and orderly. And how do you explain that? We're not even going to guess. That's not our job. We're only going to ask the question. And if your response is to shout at us slogans dumber than the slogans we used to call Soviet and mock, that's not really an answer. I had to get the soaring strings there yeah, at the end. Yeah, All right, yeah. we'll cut it off. <laughs> uh, I hope you all enjoy that. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> what takes God. that from like a little travelogue vignette to just pure <laughs> propaganda is Russia is Tucker saying how shocked he is at how nice the subways are. 
The reason he shouldn't be shocked is because Moscow's metro system is famously beautiful. Google it. You can buy books entirely about this subject because the Moscow metro was built to be functional, yes, but it was also built for propaganda purposes. Stalin wanted to show idiots like Tucker Carlson that the Soviet system was superior. And uh, to build it, by the way, he diverted food from rural areas to these construction workers and left farmers to starve, many, many of them. So again, great leadership. Tucker could learn this, what do you think, 30 seconds of Googling? But obviously, uh, he left it out on purpose because we know how easy it would have been to just figure out that the subway was nice. Your thoughts on the subways? Do you have- <laughs> I, 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 I think we had to kind of keep coming back and replaying some of these I do clips too. I want to watch these every day. There's so much fun. I mean, first of all, like maybe he should go to like uh, Pyongyang next because uh, exactly. that's the poorest fucking exactly. country in the world. And there's like some amazing parade grounds. Like Tucker's the kind of guy who go and be like, wow, look at these goose stepping wow. North Koreans. Big missiles. They seem to really love Kim Jong-un. You know, like uh, I stayed in a nice suite, you know, with a stocked mini bar in Pyongyang. They don't have any shortages here. Like this guy should be so. doing like a tour through like the gut-wrenching, hollowed out industrial heartland of Russia or like the war decimated you know, agricultural villages, uh, you know, I mean, what a fucking idiot, you know, <laughs> like it's embarrassing. I, I, it's humiliating. I mean, well, either in, cause it, this is the thing, either he is the stupidest person alive yes. and is like, wow, I'm in a beautiful Metro stop that Stalin built. Um, or he knows full well it's propaganda and it's he's that. literally just making himself the most useful idiot ever for, for Putin who's simultaneously like killing his main oppositionist because that opposition is, exposes the lie of Russia being, you know, not not being a hollowed out corrupt uh, country in which most people get totally screwed over by the regime. Like either way, and, and I just can come back one more time, Tommy, I know I had this earlier with Tucker. Um, the royal we really- I, It drives me, me crazy. Like, like we were who shocked. Is we? Yeah, yeah, who are these people that are with him? Again. Are they imaginary friends? Like his, you know, his, his, his Stalin They and, work uh, at tuckercarlson.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's not some big organization. Yeah, but he also did one where he said he was radicalized by lower prices at the supermarket. He didn't mention that, you know, there's lower prices, but also uh, per capita GDP in Russia is one fifth uh, of that in the United States. But you'll like this, Ben. He flew, Tucker flew from Russia to a conference in Dubai where he spoke to some group of autocrats and said, if you can't use your subway, for example, as many people are afraid to in New York City because it's too dangerous, you have to sort of wonder, like, isn't that the ultimate measure of leadership? I don't know. Maybe one other measure is like not killing your, your political opposition. rivals. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like a measure of leadership. Like a, um, <laughs> yeah. Did you see that uh, Putin later complained that his interview with Tucker was too soft and he was hoping that he would be aggressive and ask <laughs> yeah, tough yeah. questions? Yeah, that was like, uh, that, yeah, that was uh, like- A plus th- trolling. It just shows you that Putin can't, like, like you. he's going to troll you in the end. Just, you know, like, uh, you're not going to be his friend. Uh, Fucking asshole. A uh, quick update on the space nukes story, Ben. So uh, we talked about this quickly in the bonus uh, YouTube I did. Last week, Congressman Mike Turner, the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, released this cryptic statement calling on President Biden to declassify information about what he described as a serious national security threat. Obviously, reporters freaked out, called every source they had, and quickly figured out that Turner was referring to intelligence that Russia is developing a nuclear weapon that could be used in space to destroy satellites by releasing an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, If you want to go deeper on this, check out the interview I did with an expert named James Acton. It is available exclusively on the Pod Save the World YouTube page. But here's a quick clip of him explaining how nuclear weapons might work in space. So, I mean, the answer is the nuclear explosion itself works differently in space. Um, But the uh, effects of the nuclear weapon are different in space from Earth. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned is if you have a huge explosion in a vacuum, you're not creating this massive shockwave, this huge amount of pressure. Uh, On the other hand, there are still effects of nuclear weapons um, that um, uh, 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 happen with space-based detonations. I mean, you're still creating intense amounts of energy, these gamma rays, uh, which basically, if you're close enough, could fry satellites. Uh, It turns out you can generate um, um, a uh, an electromagnetic pulse in satellites, which is actually generated in the body of the satellite itself, uh, rather than by interactions of the nuclear explosion with the atmosphere. So the physics of this is quite different. You know, the fucking space nukes PDB piece was sweet. 
Well, nothing like a nuclear weapons nerd because Love it. they talk about nuclear weapons like, you know, we might talk about sports. Uh, you know, if you're like, <laughs> well, if you draw up the play, it's a little bit different yeah. if you're in the red zone of the opponent than if you, and, you know, you get lulled into thinking it's just this kind of it's a normal yeah, thing to normal talk about. Normal thing, but stuck on nuclear explosions, no, exterminating entire countries. And by the way, maybe this accounts for Yulia Navalny's account being uh, suspended. That uh, Starlink might be a target mm. for uh, for these uh, space nukes or Good space point. weapons. I don't know. So Ben, now that the news is all out, there's sort of an interesting debate about why Congressman Turner like freaked out and released this crazy statement and de facto declassified all this information. So I want to run the two theories by you. The first is that Turner thought this intelligence might light a fire under the ass of Speaker Johnson, get him to schedule a vote on Ukraine funding. Plausible, I guess. Uh, The second has to do with surveillance authorities. So the Washington Post reported that the space nuke intel was collected using authorities granted by Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. That provision allows the U.S. government to conduct surveillance on foreign persons outside the U.S. who are using U.S. technology. So, you know, if a Hamas leader is using Gmail, the U.S. government can force Google to give us access to that information. Uh, Congress is currently debating whether to reauthorize Section 702. Some people think Turner might have been trying to use this moment to push for reauthorization. You buy either of those theories? I mean, this Turner guy doesn't seem like he's the three-dimensional chess type, um, but uh, they both seem like like there's probably some truth to both because, first of all, he'd just come back from Ukraine. Uh, um, and so he may have been thinking, like, I'm going to come back and show... That I'm going to push my party, and like you know, I'm glad he wanted to do that. I'm not sure this is the right way. And it is the case that whoever is like the chair of the intel committee is usually like a huge evangelist for things like Section 702. So these may have been in his brain, um, but why that led him to start like a one of these you know day long Washington freakouts over space weapons? I'm not sure. The most know. cryptic statement yeah. I've ever read. Yeah. We should dig into this Section 702 authorization yeah, yeah. debate soon because I think it expires in April. Yeah, it's and gonna people. Be a big fight. Yeah, it's gonna be a big fight. There's uh, there's strong feelings on either side. We can Very even talk about fight. the P Club. Remember the P Club? Uh, yeah. President Civil Liberties Advisory I, uh, Board. I was, uh, yeah, I'm long familiar with the P Club. I feel like the club actually has a good <laughs> middle ground between <laughs> yeah. like the ACLU position and the uh, the Biden position. P Club is one about. of those things that sounds like the kind of disease you want to be told that you have. <laughs> you know, <It's> like, like, <laughs> only Washington could invent an acronym as bad as the P Club. And yeah. it was the Obama administration that did it. I it's know. I, I played a role in it. It's in embarrassing. The, I played a role in the origins of the P Club, Tommy, Ugh, which I'll spare you the story about. P Club. Okay. Yeah. Let's turn to Gaza. Uh, so the focus area is entirely on the city of Rafa, as we talked about last couple weeks. There's 1.4 million people are now living in Rafa. Most of them are in tents or temporary structures. It's like four or five, maybe six times uh, the population that it was before the war. The Israeli government has been threatening a military assault on Rafah for weeks now. They say it's necessary to take out the remaining Hamas fighters. Uh, The Jerusalem Post reported that planning for the Rafah invasion has been done for a while and that the holdup is just diplomatic pressure from Egypt and the West, mostly the U.S. Um, But still, I mean, it's not at all clear where the evacuated refugees would go before this military assault. The options are basically push everyone into an already overcrowded corner of southern Gaza, or you just start sending people back into parts of northern Gaza that have already been cleared by the IDF. So these are all terrible options. Uh, The most recent military operations in Khan Yunus took nine weeks. A Rafah operation will almost certainly take longer if you count the time it would take to evacuate civilians and then search the Hamas tunnel network for hostages and fighters, et cetera, right? So this would be a while. Uh, An article in Vox said that the Israeli government thinks they've killed about one third of Hamas's fighters, destroyed half of Hamas's rocket supplies and demolished 20 to 40 percent of its tunnel network. So a lot more work to do. Uh, Channel 12 News in Israel reported that Israeli military intelligence believes that even if the IDF dismantles Hamas's military units, it would survive as, quote, uh, a terror group and a guerrilla group. So what we all probably would have yeah, expected before shocker. the war. Yeah. Um, so Ben, the Biden administration keeps saying that a Rafa operation would be a disaster and that Israel first needs to present a credible plan to evacuate civilians. They obviously haven't done that yet. Um, I wanted to get your theory on why. One theory is that Netanyahu believes that you know he needs a credible threat of a Rafa invasion to get leverage in these ceasefire negotiations that are ongoing. Another is that he just doesn't give a fuck what the US or anyone else says. Uh, and that his political incentives are going to push him to, you know, keep the war going for as long as possible. Maybe it's a combo, but I don't know if you have a a, a thought on uh, the political motivation here from Netanyahu and, you know, w- what's likely to happen here. 
I think, I mean, it's more likely the latter with Netanyahu. Um, the, the, and and look, I, I think this is an absolute catastrophe. I mean, the, the, they're not going to achieve their military objectives by going to Roth because they can't achieve their military objectives. They're unachievable. We've talked about this. Um, Hamas is going to be stronger as a movement no matter how many tunnels they blow up. I mean, it's just so obvious that that's the case. Um, like literally, you, you, you will strengthen Hamas by going into Rafa. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how many, you, you, you kill some more people and you have a higher body count of Hamas fighters you can claim and you blow up 20% more tunnels. Um, Hamas is, is, is so obviously going to survive a Rafa assault. Meanwhile, the cost is going to be further incalculable loss of Palestinian life, the, 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 the lack of assistance getting in, could, you know, again, continue to have this exponential increase in Palestinian suffering, yeah. the, the ability to rebuild anything after you've destroyed it all, the ability I and mean, all of this. So the point is that Rafa, I mean, this should have already happened. And, you know, we've been for a ceasefire for a very long time on this podcast um, for conditioning military assistance. You know, I don't see how the U.S. can possibly support Israel, this Israeli government, um, if they go forward with this, yeah. uh, I mean that's that's the bottom line. Yet we're still pushing for a supplemental funding bill in Congress, which is crazy. Like why? It has like, no conditions. Yeah, yeah. And then just the other day, there was another weapons shipment to the IDF that just kind of happened through that other process, where you know we, we keep like periodically there's just reports of like hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons sales. Why can't we do that to Ukraine? Apparently, if you, you know, like, if you can just do these things, you know, I too am confused. Uh, by yeah, that. yeah, yeah. The, the one piece of pressure. Look, I mean, I you and I we've been frustrated for five months now yeah. that there's. A carrot but no stick approach when it comes to VPN. And then you could see all this coming. You know, like right. when I see these reports, like, wow, that we, they've done an analysis and found that they can't rescue the hostages military. They, I know. They've done analysis and found that you can't defeat that. Wow, Hamas seems to be getting stronger in Palestinian society. With well, what do you think is going to happen? It's like you state the obvious, you put it in, it's like an intelligence report yeah. and it, it and carries suddenly, more yeah, weight. It carries more weight. You know? It's worth mentioning. The, the one sort of stick I've seen is. Al Jazeera broke the news that the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has drafted a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a temporary ceasefire as soon as practical that involves all hostages getting released, lifts all barriers to humanitarian assistance into Gaza, and opposes a ground offensive into Rafah. Now we're still vetoing every other U.N. Security Council yeah, resolution today, calling for a ceasefire, yeah. including today. But I mean, that would be a pretty big change in terms of our posture at the U.N. Well, yeah, to get put forward. I, I think I that, support that. I think that that. So what does it mean for the U.S. to shift beyond just kind of rhetorical criticism of Netanyahu? I think it means uh, supporting a ceasefire resolution at the U.N. It means conditioning uh, military assistance. Um, it means, uh, you know, being much more willing to, to break from the Israeli government in terms of how you articulate your commitment to a Palestinian state, maybe recognition of a Palestinian state. There's like this spectrum of, of options available here. Yeah, you just got to take them. Yeah, and you just got to take them. And then because the more Netanyahu drifts to this far right direction, you, you know, the, the the more space I think there is to, you know, once you do the break, you know, you actually want it to matter. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, not helpful department, uh, Brazilian President Lula da Silva compared the war in Gaza to the Holocaust while speaking to reporters at the African Union Summit in Ethiopia. The exact quote was, what is happening in the Gaza Strip and to the Palestinian people hasn't been seen in any other moment in history. Actually, it did when Hitler decided to kill the Jews. Uh, pretty outrageous, inaccurate, unhelpful comment there from Lula. Exactly the kind of thing, too, that um, Netanyahu used to to rally political support around from the right wing. Yeah, and it's just stupid, too, because it, 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 it look, even if you think that this is like the absolute worst case, like, why, why why is that the analogy, right? right? Like, you you know, there, there's been, there have been other horrific, you know, things that have happened in the last 100 years that you could draw upon, you know, like what, what this, this does bother me. Okay. Like we should call should, this yeah. out because this happens a lot. Like, why does this have to be compared to, as like an apples to apples? Like the, the nothing, like, like there are no horrors that have happened in human history between the Holocaust and what's happening in Gaza now. Like, I don't want to go through the list of horribles, but like, this is strange psychologically. And, and it, it seems designed to, to, I don't know, to, to, trolls, not even a strong enough word, but uh, like, I, I don't, I don't yeah. quite understand it. There's like two pieces of red. There's like a rhetorical piece, which is like to take away your Trump card and your argument, which say, actually, this is just as bad as the Holocaust, which it's not. Um, Six million people is an unimaginable scale of death. But there's also, you know, sort of like a piece of it, like picking at your, most deeply held 
insecurity and fear as and a trauma nation. And, yeah, yeah, trauma. Yeah. I mean, because again, I, I, I'm not doing any comparisons here just for, for the record, but it's not like you couldn't pick other atrocities that have happened, even if you think that's what this is, yeah. you know? So there's just something, just come up with different analogies, you know, like the, it, 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 it I, I, yeah, this is a weird one to me that, that people feel the need to do this. Me too. And like Lula, you probably hate Netanyahu and you're trying to say something really harsh and mean. But you're offending millions and millions of people. You're hurting them, and you're you know just wrong. Yeah. Well, and, and, yeah. You, you're taking a. And here's the other thing I'd say. Um, you're taking what should be moral high ground, and you're kind of yeah. cheapening your own moral high ground. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the other thing we wanted to talk about is Semaphore uh, reported that a DC-based public affairs company with close ties to the Biden administration is working behind the scenes to discredit journalists that they view as biased against Israel. This is called the 10-7 Project. Uh, the 10-7 Project uh, staffers share daily memos about what they perceive to be unfair press coverage over the war and have gone after specific reporters that they think are biased. So one example in this semaphore story was a five-page dossier was compiled on a Washington Post reporter named Louisa Lovelock. Uh, this dossier noted some errors or corrections to her stories and even got into tweets she sent in college back in 2009. Here's like the relevant part. The tweets included uh, tweets from 2011 saying former President George W. Bush's memoir made her angry and former President Barack Obama's silence in Egypt's post-Arab Spring elections was deplorable and post noting that she watched Al Jazeera with her mother. Uh, Ben, I have a few thoughts about this. Uh, Some stupid, some serious. First of all, if you're a college kid and you're tweeting that a presidential statement or non-statement is deplorable, you should seek help because that is terminally lame. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the only people that say deplorable with a straight face work in the fucking State Department, and we should think about whether they should be doing that. Or Hillary Clinton. Or Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> basket of <laughs> basket of non-statements. Uh, second, like on some level, this kind of oppo research is not new. It, you, none of us should be surprised in 2024 that like stuff you tweet or post on social media could be used against you. But big but here, I do think this shit is a huge problem when it comes to uh, this issue in particular and Washington in particular. So like just so listeners know, Ben and I have burned the boats when it comes to potential yeah. future in government yes, service yes. because like our comments about Netanyahu alone would make us unconfirmable yeah, yeah, in some State yeah, Department job. Yeah. And I don't say that because like I think it's a pat on the back. Yeah. It's just to show you when you when you wonder why journalists staffers, former staffers, people who want a life in foreign policy or public service are so cautious when they're talking about this. It's because of efforts like this to find everything you stayed into police speech and police language. And yes, like comments like Lula de Silva's call that out, right? Like there's bias, there's anti-Semitism, there's unfair press coverage. Like some of that is fair game, but like digging up this girl saying she watched Al Jazeera with her mother. What, what the fuck is the point of that? What's yeah, the relevance? Yeah. There's this like relentlessness to this effort to discredit and attack anybody that, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember like one of my last interviews in the White House uh, was like PBS NewsHour and we'd, we'd allowed, we'd supported or allowed the resolution to pass condemning Israeli settlements. And I'm not asking anybody to remember PBS, this. look at you, flashy. No, but here's the thing. <laughs> the point is that I, I said like the number of settlements that have been constructed. Uh-huh. And, and what I meant was like the settlement units, you know. Um, How dare you. So like, the, the, you know, think of it this way. Like it's like the number of apartments, not the number of apartment buildings, buildings yeah. or something. You would have thought like they, there was this huge fucking fact check and oh, no. they forced like, you know, Judy Woodruff to read a hostage statement <laughs> condemning me the next day. I had like thousands of people tweeting at me, like probably state sponsored and otherwise like people were hounding me about this for, for like months. And I'm like, this is fucking crazy, guys. Like this would not happen on any other issue. There's that guy, right? Josh Block, who used to attack yeah, us people, on. Yeah, like, this, <laughs> is, like, this is not happen on any other issue. Crazy, like, there, yeah. There's this kind of level of minutia. And what I will say also is it's really disappointing when you see kind of democratic firms like this doing this I kind know. of garbage I because know. do I expect this out of like some APAC affiliated like right wing mean venal like if you are the FDD. staff yeah exactly if you are the staff putting together this kind of dossier on like a a good journalist at the Washington Post be better it's like, like a Baghdad you know, bureau chief like a, a yeah. brave reporter doing really hard work in dangerous conditions yeah, it, like it, stop going through her college tweets like we all know like we've done stuff in politics that we don't love but if you're literally sitting there like trying to discredit a Washington Post journalist over what she did in college, you've gone way too far. You've strayed way too far 
from what is something you should be able to look yourself in the yeah, mirror about. Yeah, be like us. Cut ads about how John McCain can't use yeah, a computer. Yeah, do some underwear ads here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I didn't have any ads. <laughs> I didn't yeah, yeah. Uh, Deep cut from 2008. Deep cut. Uh, two more, three more quick things. Uh, okay, Ben, so unfortunately, uh, we had another tough blow for democracy in uh, the latest election in Indonesia. So initial data shows that Prabowo Subianto is likely to win with over 60% of the vote, which is a landslide victory. Uh, Subianto is the defense minister... He is a 72-year-old former army general who was once banned from entering the U.S. because of alleged human rights abuses. He was the leader of a special forces unit that was accused of killing hundreds of people in East Timor and also kidnapping, torturing, and killing pro-democracy students who imposed the former dictator, uh, the Suharto regime. So he is also married to the Suharto family and is considered part of the inner circle. Uh, Subianto chose the son of current president Yoko Widodo to be his vice president, even though this guy is only 36 years old and the rules say you have to be 40. Somehow got around that one. Uh, Subianto also portrayed himself as a cuddly cat-loving grandpa, which I guess appealed to the younger voters on TikTok. Half the population uh, of Indonesia is under 40. So we don't have final election results yet because Indonesia is a country of 270 million people. It encompasses over 17,000 different islands. So elections are a massive logistical undertaking, but they do this thing called quick count data they, they pull like a couple thousand polling locations, like exit polling, uh, and it made clear that there's not going to be a runoff election in June. Uh, ben, I saw Subianto held a press conference earlier this week while swimming laps in his pool. So that was a first. Uh, how are you feeling about this um, cuddly human rights violating grandpa running Indonesia? Not great. Um, okay. and, and I think there are Thought a couple of things that. that are depressing about it. Uh, one is that like, you know, the outgoing president, Jokowi, um, you know, he got elected. He was kind of this outsider man of the people guy, you know, like he'd been a mayor. He'd yep. been like a worker like he he um, he didn't come from one of these like dominant you know, ruling cliques or the military. Um, and and this he beat this guy twice, by twice. the way. Right. And this guy did a Trump both times and said he was rigged yeah. and everything. Send people to the and, streets. And so but Jacoby like, you know what, what can continue my legacy um, and what's pretty clear is he made some deal with this guy. He said, so, take my kid. Take my kid, make him the running mate. I'll be the power behind some throne. Um, Jokowi has this like plan to build like a $40 billion new capital of Indonesia in the middle of the jungle. Um, kind of a weird legacy thing. This guy's promised to continue that. God knows what corruption's involved in that, by the way. I couldn't even imagine. There's like you know, billions of dollars in contracts to build some capital. So it just has this whiff of, you know, this guy, Jokowi, was supposed to represent a different kind of politics, kind of turned into the standard politics, yeah. right? Jokowi is what people call Widodo. Widodo, the, yeah. It's kind of like, his, like the- It's like calling Abu Mazen, yeah, 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 Mahmoud yeah, yeah, Abbas yeah, yeah. and Palestinian yeah. Authority is Abu Mazen uh, to the cool kids. That's true. Like, we got to be in the know here on yeah. parts of the world. Um, but then the other thing I'd say is that just, man, like the year of elections- It's not going uh, good. Continues to really deliver thus yeah. far. Like, Naturally yeah. fucked us yeah, with all these elections. Yeah, I, I, I kind of give- um, uh, you know, the other uh, autocratic team has got a good team, you know, Bukele crushes. Uh, you've got Jokowi, like, you know, they've got this kind of autocrat. Are we doing know. a draft? Well, I'm just saying, Autocrats that, versus like, 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 basically every election is kind of confirming yeah. this negative trend. You know, we got India looming on the horizon. Like, Not I'm good. sure the BJP will crush there. Um, you know, in the, the coup de grace is going to be obviously the U.S. election. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of see... You know, I don't want to be too pessimistic here, but there, there, there's a narrative that could build that by the end of this year, it's like, is there democracy anymore? I know. You know? I know. We need the Labour Party yeah. in the UK to kind of save us. Yeah, that's us. the only one that seems like it's uh, Come on, fellas. trending favorable. Yeah. Uh, two more things. Uh, last week, Ben, Jared Kushner spoke at some conference in Miami. I think it was hosted by Axios. He was asked about the $2 billion kickback he got from the Saudi government's sovereign wealth fund to his private equity firm. Some call it investment. I call it a kickback. Uh, here is a quick clip of the question and Jared's response. As you said, uh, lots and lots of private equity firms, other folks are, are trying to raise money from Saudi Arabia and, and are raising money from Saudi Arabia. Some, however, stopped after the Jamal Khashoggi murder. Some, some either gave money back or stopped. At the time, you didn't really, you said you wanted to wait for the DNI report, for, for the kind of official report, for the State Department report before talking about it. You kind of only give uh, very glancing mentions in your book to it. The DNI report came out a couple weeks after you left the White House. It says that MBS personally was responsible. Do you agree with the DNI? Do you or do you believe that report? Are we really still doing this, Dan? The, the questioner there was Dan Premack from Axios. So well, we, we're sparing you 
his whiny little shit answer about how MBS is a visionary leader and he ducks the question of MBS's complicity by saying he didn't see the Biden DNI report. But Jared, you had access to all the intelligence at the time. You know exactly what happened, you lying little fuck. Here's the thing about Jared Kushner. He wants to be taken seriously as somebody who has any capability or capacity whatsoever. He wants to be taken seriously as this like diplomat, as this businessman. And he is a fundamentally unserious person. And dishonest right? and corrupt. Like, and dishonest and corrupt. And everybody knows, no matter how rich this guy gets, everybody knows that the only reason is because he's corrupt and because he's Donald Trump's son-in-law and because he did the bidding of a dictator who killed people like Jamal Khashoggi and had Aaron boys like Jared Kushner cover it up for him. So everybody knows that no matter how much money he makes, it has nothing to do with his own capacity. It has to do with his corruption. Just like everybody knows that, that, that nobody would even be paying. This guy, Jared Kushner, like owned like the pink newspaper, the New York Observer. And, <laughs> and, 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 like, like he, and his whole life has been this desperate quest. His dad bought to, his to, way into Harvard. Yeah, his whole life has been this desperate quest to Ivanka. prove that he's a person of substance. And the more he does, the more he confirms the opposite here. And like the serious point I make, too, is that like the, the Jamal Khashoggi's, the Alexei Navalny's, like these people are going to be remembered, right? And, and all the Jared Kushners are like, can't we get past this already? Like, why are you bringing this up? Like, why can't you just ask me about how much money I have? And like, the point is, is it like the world tends to remember people like Jamal Khashoggi and Alexei Navalny for a good reason. Yeah. And the fact that it annoys Jared Kushner is reason enough to do it. <laughs> and to like keep asking reporters, yes. don't ever let this go. Yeah. Don't ever let this go. Everyone knows that this guy would not have gotten a $2 billion quote unquote investment from the Saudi sovereign wealth fund into a private equity firm that he had like just started that moment, if not for favors he had done for these Gulf autocrats. That's where all his money's coming Isn't from. Isn't there a better way to be an annoying rich kid? Like, can't you just like buy a place in Topanga and do drugs? You know, like, yeah. like, like, <laughs> like, like there's got to be something, you know, Ugh. like, like then, then, then trying to like just take it out on the rest of us, you know? Uh, yeah. Like do like, uh, try rapping. Yeah. Yes. Like Tom Hanks's kid. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, uh, just whatever the thing is, you know, like be a judge on a reality show or something. Um, I launch a a new write a line. Of, write a screenplay. Right. I'm I'm trying to do like I'm I'm trying to do all these things. <laughs> you actually like, have an uh, interesting yeah, story yeah, to tell. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah, the worst father-in-law yeah. in the world. Yeah. Write about that. Yeah, yeah. Like write about your pain, Jared. Yeah, like share your pain instead of like redirecting your pain on the rest of us. Take the bone saw to yeah. the to the pain. You have to treat the world the way your father treated you. Anyway, I hate that kid. Uh, last but not least, Ben, uh, the Mankini story heard around the world. Of course, we have Australia. I'm, I'm, I'm popping a Nicorette lozenge because that Jared segment. <laughs> For this one, good. Another one. Uh, okay, so Shane Rose, uh, who is on Australia's equestrian Olympic team, made headlines for wearing a G-string mankini <laughs> at an equestrian event recently. <laughs> Those who know the G-string mankini would uh, probably know it from uh, Borat. Uh, <laughs> sounds like harmless horseplay, right? Uh, well, then, his trip to the Summer Olympics was almost derailed due to this little cheeky stunt. The costume sparked an investigation by the equestrian governing body of Australia, which, no surprise, Australians like loved. They rallied to this guy's side. Uh, a bunch of Australian Olympians came out and said that Shane is not allowed to compete because of the mankini. They would start wearing them, true. <laughs> well, they would start wearing them as well at events. Uh, Rose was quoted as saying, it's a dress-up competition. I thought it'd be funny to go in a mankini. I've never worn a G-string before, and I can't recommend it to anyone. So uh, great advice from someone with a sense of humor. Let me just once again credit the people of Australia uh, who've delivered a lot of content to this podcast. Sure have. And I'm going to join these two segments that we just did, right? On the one end, you've got this kind of angry, you know, rich kid, uh, you know, trying to like prove himself by like taking money from... Uh, MBS and covering things up. And then you got a guy who's just like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wear a mankini for uh -huh. my equestrian thing and, and become like a folk hero. You have know, a great like, time. This is like why the Australians, like they, they look, they don't take this shit too seriously. Like, they, like, come on, like we need more of this in the world. Not, not necessarily mankinis, but like the mentality behind sure. the man, you know, I, cause nobody wants to see me in a mankini. Um, uh, but, Kobe had Mamba mentality. You're doing mankini, mankini mentality. Mankini mentality. That's what I'm talking about. We need a little mankini mentality. In, I like in that a lot. Yeah. I like that a lot. Well, 
That's a really hard pivot to our interview with Mstislav Chernov, <laughs> uh, unbelievably brave documentary maker, filmmaker who chronicled his time in Mariupol at the beginning of the war. But there it is. I just did there it. There it is. You did it. Uh, we'll take a quick turn. break. We come back. You'll hear from him. Mstislav Chernov is a journalist, filmmaker, and the director of the new film, 20 Days in Mariupol. Uh, thank you so much for joining and doing the show. Thank you for inviting me. So you directed, uh, you narrated, you shot this just unforgettable uh, incredibly affecting documentary film, 20 Days in Mariupol. It has been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature Film. Congratulations for that. I, I, I hope you win. I cannot imagine uh, any other film topping this film in terms of just like the impact on the world. Uh, Mariupol, for those who don't know, is a Ukrainian city right on the border with Russia. Can you explain how you ended up in Mariupol uh, as the invasion started two years ago, and what happened to the city while you were there? Well, um, that this war, uh, this invasion started for me and for most of Ukrainians ten years ago. Yeah, and at that point it was eight years ago. So uh, this escalation was not a surprise. That the size of the escalation, the scale of it, uh, was was astonishing. But we kind of expected it, and. All these years, we thought where Russia would strike, where would they attack? And Mariupol was obviously always a, a big target for them as they tried to occupy it to occupy it in 2014. I was there too at that moment. So when it was already understandable that the Russia is going to attack the day or the day after, we were in Bakhmut. That's another city that it doesn't exist anymore because it was destroyed by Russian bombs. Uh, we were there and we were discussing where would we go and the decision was to go to Mariupol because it seems to be so important and it probably was going to be surrounded just because of the the location it's very near to Russia it's on the way to Crimea so we went there and within Russia attacked Russia attacked the whole country and within days uh, the city was surrounded and the inf civilian infrastructure was targeted uh, there was no electricity no water no uh, food supplies and uh, the most importantly no communication so the city was cut off completely from the outside world and we found out that we were the only journalists at that point who were who remained in the city under the siege and we were the only ones who were reporting miraculously we were still finding uh very very little signal to be able to send what we saw and oh what we saw uh well the indiscriminate bombardment of the city was was more and more intensive more people were dying and and uh, ultimately uh, russia bombed maternity hospital the images that that shook the world the, that that uh, everyone saw uh, and probably the images which became become a, a bitter symbol of, of Mariupol. So all that I was recording, and of course I could send only very, very little of what I shot, uh, and at hours and hours of footage which were never published. And and when we miraculously escaped from the city and carried all this with us, uh, of course I wanted to make a film. I wanted, because so much wasn't published. And the story was so symbolic and so important. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you guys were the only journalists in, in Mariupol during this time. I mean, watching the documentary, I was amazed at how many of your photos and videos that I remembered seeing at the time on every single broadcast in the world, in the United States, like you guys really were the only window into what was happening into that city for, for the rest of the world. I wonder what that responsibility felt like, and if you were aware at the time that billions of people were seeing the work you were sending back. We weren't aware. We just didn't have enough connection and time to figure out the impact or the scale, the scale of the uh, how, how far these images go and what do they do. We knew about Russia trying to say we are information terrorists and, and saying this was all staged, but... That is kind of what we what we expected because every time something important and impactful happens, they they try to do it. So it didn't really influence our work. We just kept reporting. I think I found out about the the effects of what how what that those images really meant only when we st when we left the city and when I started making a film. That became also a part, well, let's say impact or lack of impact because. Sometimes it is a lack of impact that mm -hmm. is the most painful. Was is actually a part of a film. The journalism and uh, and and fake news is is a part of the theme of the film. And 
I, I address exactly that when, as I was uh, as I was making a film. And it gives a lot of actually it gives a lot of useful context to people who saw these images in the news, a lot of info important context to them how was how they were actually made. Right. I mean, it's, uh, incredible people all around you helping you guys. I mean, you t you mentioned this a, a minute ago. The the Russians tried to claim that images that you took from the bombing of a maternity ward in a hospital, uh, think about that for a second, were fake. You got swept up into this disinformation effort. Did you guys, were you aware of that at the time? And what, what did it feel like to, to know like the most horrific thing you could ever imagine was turned upside down like that by the by the Russian government. As a journalist, I don't get much of as international journalist, I don't get much affected by that. Actually it's it's a kind of a compliment to your work because if, if you are getting attacked for your work, if if it's contested means it means something, right? Mm, yeah. It's just it was seen and it made an impact. Uh, I knew that journalistically speaking and, and that you know from point of view of of, of documentary record uh, we needed to follow up this story. We needed to find those uh, those women who suffered in this bombing and who were called actors. But uh, nevertheless, we would follow that story anyway because it was so important to know what was happening with them. So it it didn't impact my work at all. All that being said, I know which how devastating devastating it is to hear for Ukrainians or for people of Mariupol and for people who lost their families in those bombings to, to hear something like that. It's not just to lose someone or to, to lose your city and to be injured. It's also to hear that your pain and your suffering is fake. That is so painful for them and my heart is bleeding for them. But that's what drives me when I make this film, when I, when I make sure that many as many people as possible see that film. Just to make sure that their suffering is is not uh, is not doubted, it's, yeah. it's remembered. A lot of the scenes you capture in the film are shot in a hospital. Um, they're some of the most challenging things I can imagine shooting. Or, or frankly, I was sitting at my desk crying at work. You know, it's like footage of dead or injured children. Um, I, I think for any parent, you probably watch and think, like, what if that were me? What if that were my child? How would I escape? Um, in the film, you include footage of people, in particular doctors, encouraging you to film, thanking you for filming. And you also have people who are literally telling you to fuck off. Um, I was wondering why you thought it was important to include both of those perspectives. And if emotionally for you, it was more difficult to cover these horrors happening uh, in your own country as compared to, you know, you've covered so many conflicts around the globe, but you know, this was home. Yeah, this is home and my conflict journalism started from Ukraine 10 years ago when Russia invaded Ukraine and I learned everything about conflict journalism and this is so personal. This is a story of my community and my country of course. It's not only your it's not only the cities that are being bombed, it's your memories are being bombed, you see, and destroyed. So, but but people are different and they react in a very different way on a stressful on a stressful events and these are the most stressful events you can imagine losing your home or your or your families and those people who told me don't film me they're not there but those people who wanted to uh to say something but even if it wasn't really nice or something you wasn't agreeing with but they still wanted to say that they are in a film it was quite important for for us to to show all the variety of responses to all the variety of, of of different reactions to the events and to journalists because it's part of a story, and if you if you hear my narr narration, I'm narrating a film. Uh, I don't moralize anyone. I, I don't I don't impose my emotions on on the audience. I'm just telling the story in the best way possible, providing as much context as possible. So you and I are talking on February 15th, just before the two-year anniversary of the, the so-called special military operation that Putin launched. Um, there are people in Mariupol still living under Russian occupation. People throughout Ukraine uh, deal with the constant threat of, of airstrikes. In the film, you say, war is like an x-ray. Good people become better, bad people worse. Um, I was wondering two years into this war, how you feel like it has impacted the nation as a whole and how people have responded. I think the, in, in a complete comprehensive way, we can understand that only when the war is over and we will be able to look back to, to our traumas, to, to our losses, to, to what we live through right now, everyone is 
is filled with with emotions with anger with sadness with with uh was just a uh, fear yeah uh, but at the same time with determination i think what what happened a part of all the horrible things that have happened to ukraine and to its residents all the traumas something something else something hopeful did come through it's it's the emergence of of a very strong bond between between all layers of the society between between communities local communities okay in the community in general of the country and that's what you see in a film as well in the worst possible moments of 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 loss of a tragedy no one is ever alone in in 20 days in mariupol right there is always someone to to be near to hug whether it's a, a doctor or a journalist uh, I did that too. You see me doing that, or or a neighbor. So this feeling of community and identity and shared tragedy and shared resistance is is what what just holds the country together right now. Because things are not going well, and in Russia, every day becomes stronger and bigger, and uh, the attention and the support to Ukraine is is fading. And uh, but that that feeling of a community and shared responsibility is never going away anymore that's that what stays forever watching these doctors go from treating people in hospital rooms to hallways to basements watching these firefighters go from you know having infrastructure and trucks and hoses to the last fire station being bombed but still trying to do the jobs it's just incredibly moving and inspiring um as you said in the earlier you say in the film too i mean the war didn't start in 2022 for people, especially in Eastern Ukraine. Um, there was Crimea, the war in Donbass, the MH17 shoot down, which you covered. Do you think that helped harden or prepare for the full scale invasion in 22, or is that even possible? Yeah, that's a, that's a painful question because it also re uh, relates to me. As a journalist, I've been covering this war since 2014. And uh, then the attention of the world shifted to Syria and to a uh, migration crisis in Europe and to many other stories, important stories that were unfolding in the world, equally deserving attention, of course. But the world has chosen to forget about, about the invasion and until 2022. And that's why I think in 2022, it came such a surprise to everyone that, oh, Russia attacked Ukraine. But but no, it's not a surprise. Russia did attack Ukraine eight years before that. Right, right. And it was not a surprise at all. And it's just have been ignored. And maybe if I did my job better as a journalist or a documentary filmmaker or as a writer to keep attention to the fact that the war wasn't going on for all these years, maybe people would be better prepared. But... This is what's constantly happening, even now when the war is raging, and not only in Ukraine. You see, the war is not only in Ukraine anymore, uh, and possibly it will be next day somewhere else, right? A lot of people still choose to ignore the fact that, that they need to do something about it. Yeah, This can't be ignored anymore, uh, because it sooner or later is going to arrive at the door of every single human being on the planet. Yeah, I think that's an important takeaway is, is imagining, watching the footage and imagining what you would do if it were you and what we can do now to prevent that. Um, along those lines, I mean, President Biden has been fighting to get more funding passed for Ukraine since last year. At the moment, it seems like that funding is being blocked by President Trump uh, and a small but very extreme slice of the Republican Party. Watching the film made me feel embarrassed all over again at the smallness and fucking stupidity of American politics, especially when compared to the gravity of what people in Ukraine are dealing with and the courage they've shown. Um, are people aware of this debate, debate that's happening in the U.S. and Ukraine? Does it feel existential for them? Is there any message you want to convey to people listening about you know, maybe lobbying Congress or doing what they can? Again, I, I can't be. I'm a Ukrainian and I'm an international journalist, I cannot be trying to convince anyone of doing anything. I believe rational uh, and informed decisions uh, should be made, but everyone has to decide for themselves. Uh, I can say how that looks from a Ukrainian perspective, that's for sure. First of all, Ukrainians will keep fighting regardless of what, what, whether there is support or not. 
it just means if there is no support, it means more death and means more destruction for civilians, uh, more Mariupol uh, type of the events. But but it's a fight for survival. You know, if Russia was attacking U.S. and if U.S. W was losing its territories, God forbid. But if no one even was supporting at that moment, right, people would still keep fighting. Yeah. So regardless of that, people will keep fighting. I think what's the most regrettable part for Ukrainians when they look at what's going on right now in in, in Europe and in U.S. It's 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 that they see that they're that Ukraine became a political, that supporting Ukraine became a political question. Because it's, first of all, it's a humanitarian problem. Mm -hmm. It's a humanitarian issue. And that's what comes through in 20 days in Mariupol. When you see that, you see humans, civilians suffering, and they need help. And this can't be used as a bargaining political chip in any way. And that's that's why Ukrainians are frustrated sometimes when they hear the news. But obviously, they are grateful for every single, for like, for everything that, for all the help that already came to Ukraine, and they will be grateful for everything that will come. Uh, they will be grateful for any support. But it's just when when their suffering and their fight is made into a bargaining, political bargaining chip, that's what insults Ukrainians. That's what I see in their like in their eyes when I uh, when I speak with them. It's it's not a political. Uh, question. Yeah, it's existential. Um, last question for you. So, you know, President Zelensky's leadership in the early months of the war was, was I think, universally seen as uh, astounding and heroic. Um, obviously, after two years of war, it is understandable that the situation grows more challenging and complicated and politics sort of take over in some sense. Um, he recently made some changes to the military and political leadership. There's been some reporting about concerns over elections getting postponed or maybe martial law uh, remaining in place, questions about the draft. Do you have a sense as a journalist just what, if there's been a change in terms of popular support for this government or if people are still just, you know, behind him? You know, what's great about Ukraine is Ukrainians are always very, very aware of what's happening to their country. They're, they're very, there's... Uh, very active citizens. There's a huge layer of active uh, active citizens, it's active citizenship. So uh, you can't really lie to them. You can't really um, uh, hide anything from them. People see everything that's happening. So they are very sensitive to any changes or any political conflicts that are happening. Uh, but at the same time, they they clearly know what the country needs, and uh, Ukraine right now needs uh, a unity, a, any political political unity, a military military unity, international unity. So, uh, understanding that Ukrainians uh, do keep supporting uh, the government and what they support, even if they see problems, they support the unity. Here's here's what what's the main thought here, uh, and they will be supporting those who provide that unity to the country, and so far that's what's what's been happening. But of course, all the problems that are happening there, we see them. It's and we see them. It's because Ukrainians are so sensitive and, mm -hmm. and very well aware of these changes. They're very well aware of of the fight against the corruption. They are very well aware of what's happening on the front lines. So, yeah, of course there are problems. But any country would have problems during during the war, and especially when you when you fight to an enemy which is so much bigger. Yeah, I mean, I think what's just so astounding from my perspective is just the way Ukrainians have been able to adapt despite all that's happening around them. You've got, you know, kids going to school, people going to work, you know, getting, you know, playing guitar for the kids in the bomb shelter to try to keep things feeling a little bit normal, as you know, seen in your movie. I'm just wondering, uh, how is it possible to adapt? Is this just necessity or is this something unique to Ukraine? Partially it is because Ukrainians have been adapting for this for years. Maybe uh, when it was the first year, uh, it takes it takes a lot of effort and 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 time to 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 be able to exist in in a kind of a normal way 
when the war is so near you, when the rockets every day hit your city. But it was happening for a while already. So so that 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 it really helps. And humans in general and Ukrainians are are amazing into in, in their resilience, in their in their wish to live the normal lives and and Actually, that's what you want to do when when you raise children. You want to provide as much normality to them as possible, yeah. even when when it's not possible. You know what, what what scares me a lot is that in the beginning of the war, in the beginning of the invasion, uh, in full scale invasion, Russia was saying that there are you know, all these absurd uh, all these absurd claims that they are fighting Nazis and right, they're right. they're protecting Russian speaking population. And they were killing Russian speaking population at the same time. They were excusing themselves with, with that. But right now they they it's a very different narrative. I'm not sure that the international community hears that narrative that is happening within Russia. They motivate their people and their society, which also is getting used to war, and their their politicians and soldiers with with one single thought. They are at war with US and Europe. They are currently at war with 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 everyone, with the West, and and a lot of people in the West choose not to notice that that's a, a more than a hundred million people country with a nuclear weapons, very aggressive, producing a lot of weapons, getting a lot of money from 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 oil is currently at war with them, and no one seems to be fully prepared for that, even mentally. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and people should probably do a little more listening to uh especially the countries or people in ukraine of course but also you know the the baltic countries and parts of nato that are closest to the front lines that are increasingly alarmed um but listen the the film is 20 days in mariupol it is uh you can find it on youtube it is one of the most affecting things i've watched uh in many many years i cannot recommend it enough uh and mrs slav chernoff thank you so much for joining the show thank you so much for inviting me stay safe you too thank you again truly Appreciate your time. Thanks again to Mrs. Slav Chernoff uh, for making an unbelievable film and for joining us on the show. Thanks again to the Mankini guy. Uh, yeah. Not so much to Jared. He can go fuck himself. No. Um, oh, God, Jared. Um, yeah, I don't know who else. I mean, who, um, and Maria and Daria for, for talking to us for the show about their experience both inside and outside of Ukraine. And to that, yes, uh, to all the Ukrainians who've shared your stories for two years, actually. Um, and, and we're glad we could use this uh, anniversary to to bring that back and remind people of like the the human uh, piece of this thanks to that unbelievable space nerd you talked to too i i really did uh, rolls the, he really broke things down too so uh, good job by you james acton james that acton. guy's the best james acton. That great guy's guy the best uh, okay that's it for us talk to you soon